Okay, everybody. Uh, hello and welcome to this week's uh, One We Wine Seminar, which is also the final One We Wine Seminar of the semester. Uh, so today's talk will be by Gabriele Steidel. Uh, she is a professor at the Technische Universität Berlin. She earned her doctorate from the University of Rostock in 1988. She's a SIEM fellow and the program director of the SIEM activity group on imaging sciences. Her research includes both computational harmonic analysis, image processing, and also, as we will see today, machine learning. Uh, the title of the talk is Generative Modeling via Maximum Mean Discrepancy Flows. So the floor is yours, Gabriele. <laughs> OK, I hope you can hear me or everybody can hear me. Many thanks, Axel, for inviting me and uh, also for giving me this opportunity to give this talk. And yeah. Okay, first I have to say it's joint work with uh, many people from my group, Johannes Hertrich, Fabian Altekrüger, Robert Weinert, Manuel Graef, and also Paul Hagemann. So and they, I will do the following. First, I give a small motivation why I became interested in this topic at all. Then I um, explain what are the Stein gradient flows, which will play a big role in my talk. Then we come to something which Axel already announced. We try also to do this now neural by using neural networks. And the first, the fourth point is about complexity, namely, if we do it in a straightforward way, it will be have a really uh, hard complexity, arithmetic complexity. So we go to sliced transforms. And finally, I will give conclusion. So let me start something which dates back. Uh, are we missing slides? Like... Sorry. Huh? Are you sharing your slides? Sorry. So interrupt. Yeah. Uh, you cannot see me? Do, do, are, is anyone always able to see the slides? Yeah, we cannot see the slides. Yeah, oh, sorry, could you maybe try that again? Oh, then we try it again. You haven't seen the beginning. Okay, then. No, um, yeah, yeah. What should I do now? I, I, um, I there go, used to be shared and then it stopped. So maybe just screen share your again. screen again. Yeah, yeah, I, I shared it, but then. Um, we try that again. So, yeah, now, yeah, it's on now. Okay, there we it's have good. It, there it's we good. Have it. yeah. Now you have it, yeah. And I do yeah, yeah, it's good. Down. And then you see again the title generative modeling via maximum. Yeah, it's good, it's good. Here yeah, are the guys yeah. I'm working with. I have no no photos of them, but they look really nice. You can trust me. So and then this is the outline of my talk. So now I'm here. It's the motivation. Now you see everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. Do you see the eye of the tiger? So the motivation was the eye of the tiger. No, it was we want to. What uh, many years ago you see, nearly 13 years ago, so eternity in machine learning. Uh, we were trying to do something what your printer is doing, namely half-toning of the images. And this is the following. If we have an image like this eye of the tiger, then we want to do what the printer is doing. The printer cannot print gray values. It can only put points in some distances in the image. And if you have a look at here, this is just the same image with point. And if you go a little bit more far away or make this right image a little bit smaller. Do you see my cursor, by the way? This here, when I do something, when I point into, do you yes, see yes, yes. Okay, that's fine. So, and I want to put points there. So, okay, and um, yeah, and um, then we uh, we did it by uh, we we want to do it by minimizing a certain function, which is written here. And I consider this already in in the in the in the meaning I will use later, namely that my first image I consider this at a uh, at a probability density, at a discrete measure or at atomic measure, and these at grid points it's a digital image. And row of ij are these are weights of my image, and you can. Think if, if I have black, then these weights are larger, and if the weights are smaller, then I have white values in my image. And these are just delta ij, these are the grid points in the image. And the overall thing is an atomic measure. So, and now what I want to do, I want to approximate this atomic measure by an empirical measure where I have the same weights everywhere. I have just points, no gray values now, but these points are at special positions, xk, and I want to find these positions. So far, so good. So what I do is I want to I minimize a certain function which is given here, namely it consists of a so-called attraction term and a repulsion term. And you see that it makes really sense to find these points x by minimizing these functions over these point positions. Namely, if this row is black, so it's very huge, then in order to minimize these functions, these points must or this here must be small. That means this point xk must be near to this grid point where I have a black value. Okay, makes sense, no? So, but however, if I would only use this first functional, here, this attraction functional, 
then the points may cluster this xk. And this is something I don't want here. That's why I need a repulsion term. And this repulsion term comes with a minus here, and it becomes small if xk and xl are far away from each other. And this is, uh, this is now my attraction repulsion term. And what we did, say, 13 years ago was that we tried to minimize this. And I have to say, in the first paper, it comes was a paper by Joachim Weikert and his group, they used not just a distance kernel here, they used a column, a column kernel, one divided by this distance here, and they called it electrostatic half-toning. So, and then we want to, uh, we started to minimize this function in XK, and what we used was, or also what Joachim used, was, was a very simple algorithm, namely a gradient descent algorithm. So, and now, of course, you are lost if you do gradient descent, and you can imagine these here can be 30,000 points, for example, and you have to, to consider every point together with every point, then it's, it's really extensive. And what we used for this later in our papers was an NFFT, a full transform on non-equi space nodes. So, and then we, uh, moreover, Joachim started with R to the power of minus one. And later we, we thought that we could also do it just with a distance here. And this distance will play a role in my talk later. And if I take a distance here, then you see this is, is the difference of two convex functions in this XK. And at this time, the algorithms, which were called difference of convex functions algorithms, were very popular. And we have used all of these algorithms. Nevertheless, we have to compute gradients and we have to compute, we have to use the NFFT. But this is only in two dimensions. And we will see later, this will appear again later in my talk, exactly the same functional, but then every point will not be a point in 2D. These points will be wall images, and I will do something in very high dimensions. And NFFT will work in one, two, and three dimensions, but not in higher dimensions. No, and then I can never not, not use NFFT later. So, okay, this was the first thing. So what this has to do with my talk, what this has to do with Wasserstein gradients rows and later with neural networks. Okay. This was just gradient descent. And I was thinking, okay, and this is a little bit boring. And then I heard about Wasserstein gradient flows. And people are doing many interesting things with this. And I was thinking, okay, can I reinterpret this here as a Wasser, as a so-called Wasserstein gradient flow? Then it's more funny, more, so more fancy, and then I can sell it a little bit better. And that's why I started to have a look what are these Wasserstein gradient flows. So, and now I show you some more images. They are coming from a paper, which was 10 years later, and it has nothing to do. I just want to show nothing to do with the later part of my talk. I just want to show these images. Also, Pierre is here and he did similar thing. Namely, now we want to approximate this atomic measure here by measures which are supported on lines and not on points. They are like this, these empirical measures. And I just show it also works and um, it was originally initiated by um, the group in Toulouse, I think, and, and we did it later then, and I showed just our images, which we did here. So this is now just for showing you some nice images. You can also try to approximate this measure here by starting in some measure on lines, and then move along this path and go here. So, and um, this is, is something, a great and decent algorithm in some sense. I just saw this image because I like that. So, and you can do it on the sphere, you can do it with points, you can do it with lines, and you can do it also on, on, on the torus. And my favorite image, you can do it on Grassmanians. But this is just to show you that not only measures which points are interesting, but maybe later we could also consider measures which are supported on lines, but not in this talk. So now comes the thing what this gradient descent algorithm has to do with Wasserstein gradient flows, which I have used to minimize my function. So also let's go to Wasserstein gradient flows. So, okay, and in, before I explain what are Wasserstein gradient flows, what are gradient flows in so-called Wasserstein spaces, I want to explain what are gradient flows on RD. So, okay, to this end, let us first consider a function, a multidimensional function in very high dimensions, which goes to R. So what is now such a gradient flow? It's an absolutely continuous function, so you can have a, a tangent in, in different uh, places here. Oh, by the way, I have here a button in my my screen. So, okay. So, 
And, and this gradient flows does the following. What, we, what you basically want to do, you want to find a minimizer of this function f. This would be our aim during this talk. We want to find a minimizer of f, and we want to do this by starting in some point in Rd, and then follow such a curve here, such an absolutely continuous curve. And this, uh, this curve goes in each point in the direction which is given by the negative gradient of f. You know, the negative gradient is the direction where you have the steepest descent, and we take negative direction of f, and we plug in the point where we are. This is a vector field now, and this describes the movement of my curve. So, and here you have an example. Oh, this is not what I want. Uh, maybe this, okay, you, here you see an example. Here you have the level lines of the functional. This is the minimum of the functional. And then what I want to do, I want to start here in some point, and then I want to follow a curve which follows the negative gradient. You know, the negative gradient is perpendicular to the level lines. And so you go down, 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 down. And after a while, you hopefully come to one minimizer of your curve. And you can start at different points and hopefully this happens. And you can, one can show that this goes down. And if f is in C1, you can use Pika Lindelof that this ordinary differential equation has a unique solution. And yeah, it should be somehow related with the minimizer of f. So somehow related brings me to the next theory. Uh, namely, there is a definition which uh, where of functions where everything works fine. Namely, the def oh, I have to say, if you don't have a, a if you don't have a gradient, then you can also try to put this vector field, to take this vector field just from the subdifferential of x. The definition of here is here. If you don't know what a subdifferential is, just think about what the gradient is fine, what it is fine. So now let me go when, when this really goes to a minimizer. There is a notation of lambda convexity of a function. Lambda convexity, and this is given for an arbitrary lambda in R, not only for R between, oh, I have to, uh, yeah, not only for uh, lambda in, in, in some positive lambda. So, and the definition is like the definition of convexity here, up to here, you have the definition of convexity, and then you subtract here lambda half t times one minus t and, and the norm between x and y squared. Okay, and this can only be written down, of course, for every lambda. However, if lambda is larger than zero, then you know that this is the definition of a strict convexity, then the function is strict convex, strongly convex, and you can show that f, if it has a minimizer, it has a unique minimizer, and then you can show that this gradient flow converges exponentially fast in t, if t goes to infinity, to the minimizer of this function. So it's really a good idea to make this gradient flow. So you can do the similar thing if you are now not in RD, but say on a manifold, then you take all, can also uh, compute or can also define gradient flow on manifolds. The only difference is you need, again, a first order differential equation, and you need a direction where you, your curve has to go. And here you must be a little bit careful. This is not such a nice image, but your curve has to go in the direction of the gradient of the curve in the tangent space. So the Romanian gradient of this curve here, yeah, in the tangent space, and then you go in this direction and same thing as before. Okay, this was gradient flow, very simple in RD and gradient flows on many. So now we go to another space, which is no longer RD, but a so-called Wasserstein space. What are these Wasserstein spaces? Remember, what I want to do is I want to work somehow with measures né, in my motivations. So, okay, Wasserstein spaces are spaces of probability measures, which have finite second moments. Yeah, If you are in RD, you need this condition. If you are on a compact thing, not in RD, then you can skip this condition at the second moments. So, and these spaces have a nice property, namely they are complete matrix spaces, and there is a matrix in the spaces which is the Wasserstein two matrix, and is, is defined as follows: you take the distance between x and y, x and y are just in R D. You take the square here, that's why it's Wasserstein two, and then you take the integral over a two-dimensional distribution, and this distribution now you must relate it to mu and nu. And this distribution has a property that the two marginals of the distributions are just mu and nu. So and this is written here. And such a distribution in general is called transport plan. And if, um, if this transport plan is really a minimizer of the right-hand side, it's an optimal transport plan. 
So, okay, and here in the definition that the right and the left marginals are mu and nu, I have already used the so called uh, the definition of a push forward measure, which will play a role in my talk also later. And a push forward measure is the following it's a very simple thing. Namely, you have a measurable function t, which goes from, say, rd to rd. And then you um, define a new measure by doing the following. You take just the inverse or the inverse of this t to the power of minus one, the pre-image, not maybe the inverse doesn't exist, so this is a pre-image. You apply this, uh, uh, this t to the power of minus one to one to a set, and then you take t to the minus one, it gives a new for a set, and then you take uh, this new measure of this new set. So it's then a new measure in the space where the C is mapping. Yeah? And we will see it later in my talk. It's just because the sign also appears here in the definition of the buses. So and there is another thing we will be need a little bit later. Namely, sometimes you can describe these Wasserstein distances in a nicer way not by leaving the measures and going to something which may be somewhat familiar to you, namely to mappings instead of these plans here, to so-called maps instead of plans. And this is the theorem of Brenier, which says the following. If the measure here, one measure here in this uh, Wasserstein distance is absolutely continuous, this is this R here, comes from a regular, then you can describe this optimal optimizer here in this Wasserstein two distance by a, so, by a function, that, that's, which is called transport map. Then this is a function from RD in RD, and it's an L2 function with respect to this measure mu. So, and then this plan has the following form. You take the identity, you take your map, and then you take a push forward with mu. That means that every, uh, in this special case, every plan corresponds to a map. We will have this later in my talk. And then you can rewrite this Wasserstein distance in such a way, namely this x remains x, and this y is now just the transport of x by this map t. So then you take the quadratic uh, distance here, and now you need only d mu of x, and the marginal condition comes here with subject two, t push forward mu should be mu. That means you take your original measure, push forward is by the t, and get mu. And later in my talk, you will see that we can learn these T's here, these transport maps somehow by neural networks. That's so that they are doing this, that they are having this property here. And then this will serve somehow as a loss function. But we will see this later. So to summarize, we have now a nice matrix space. And instead of doing gradient descent in this uh, in RD, we do now such a gradient descent flow in these Wasserstein spaces. Okay. If you have questions, you may ask immediately, okay? So first one remark, I have shown you that we can do these uh, gradient flows also on many folds. Then you have to go with your curve in the direction uh, which is given by attention in the tangent space. And one message is that these Wasserstein spaces have somehow a manifold like structure. And I will explain this a little bit. Uh, if you go in the book of Ambrosio, or for, ex for example, then you see that you will have uh, indeed uh, something like a tangent space, namely so-called uh, so regular, regular tangent space. And this reg regular tangent space consists of functions, yeah, and, and these functions have a potential. I have forgotten if you go here again, but one can show that this map here, this function here from RD and RD, that it has a potential psi, and this comes here again in the definition of this tangent space. And the tangent space is now a function space. The tangent space on this probability space is, is the function space in each mu. And this is given by these uh, potentials here. And you have to take the clutter in L2 RD RD, just in the space of this mapping. Yeah? So let's have a look at this tangent space uh, a little bit closer. You could say, okay, now we have a manifold, we have a tangent space, let's go somehow in that in some directions on this tangent space. But I wrote it has only a manifold-like structure. And the reason is the following. As long as you, as you put your tangent space on, the, on a measure which is absolutely continuous, then your tangent space is an infinite dimensional subspace of this space here. And this is the Hilbert space, and an infinite dimensional subspace is also a Hilbert space. Then, and so in this case, it's very nice. You have just a Hilbert space. If your tangent space to this measure space, it's a Hilbert space. 
So however, if you leave your comfortable zone that you have an absolutely continuous measure, for example, if you put a time tangent space now in a delta measure, then the dimension here switches, namely then you have just evaluation of this gradient here. Then it consists of evaluation of this gradient in one point X, and then your tangent space is just RD. So it's not, you cannot really say that you have now a manifold which a fixed dimension of the tangent space, the dimension of the tangent space can switch. Yeah. So nevertheless, uh, these, these Wasserstein spaces are geodesic spaces. That means that there exists a geodesic between two points where you have the property that the Wasserstein distance along this curve is just C times this T uh, of two minus T one. So it's, this is the definition of the geodesic space that there exists such a geodesic which has these properties. So as I said, we want to go to these uh, Wasserstein gradient flows. I have to explain you what are the curves in these spaces. And then we will all, then we will see on the next slide that we have similar things as for gradient flows in RD, namely that nice thing happens as long as your function is lambda convex. But of course, now you are no longer in a linear space. Now you are in a geodesic space. And that's why lambda convexity is, yet, is now not um, defined along uh, lines. It's now uh, defined along geodesics. Yeah? And now we say that a function which maps from the measures into the extended real numbers is lambda convex along geodesics. And lambda can be, again, a real number just if the following holds true. You have exactly the same definition as before. Instead of taking now, um, instead of being somewhere on a line between mu and nu, you are now somewhere on a geodesic between mu and nu. And this must be smaller or equal than the right hand side. This is S in the linear case, except that you have to replace the space between mu and nu on the line by this point on the curve. And then you have to subtract here something. And, and, and instead of subtracting, I show it again. Here you subtract just the Euclidean norm in RD. Now you, of course, have to subtract something else, namely the Wasserstein distance between mu and nu. And this is the definition of lambda convexity along geodesics. And we will see that's, uh, again, a very helpful definition, a very helpful property of our F if we want, some, if we want to minimize something with respect to a gradient flow. So now it becomes a little bit more involved, namely what means gradient flow in Wasserstein space. So, and the thing which is more involved is this, this property that your curve should be absolutely continuous. I wrote the definition on the previous slide of absolutely continuous uh, in, in footnotes, but maybe you would believe me in this talk, if you want an absolutely continuous curve, then you can um, then you can characterize this also in a different way. As with this, these are curves which have somehow tangents and which have a, have a length. Or okay, and you can in in Wasserstein spaces, absolute continuity is defined or is explained or is the same as the following, namely that your curve has to fulfill a certain differential equation, namely a so-called continuity equation, and it looks like this and um, and this continuity equation has to be fulfilled in a weak sense. And in a weak sense, I, ex I put it here, means that you test it against functions in C infinity uh, with a compact support. So the only thing you have to take with you, absolute continuity in Wasserstein spaces, means that your curve has to fulfill such a, such a differential equation. And this, this V is, again, some vector field like this gradient field or a negative gradient field of a function f, but no, so far we have no function f. No, we have just a curve, which is absolutely continuous. And your, 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 your vector field or your velocity field have to fulfill such a property, nothing else. So, okay, this is one ingredient, absolutely continuous curve. So the second ingredient in Wasserstein gradient flows is that you must know in which direction you have to go. You must know this, this vector field here in order to say in which direction your curve has to go. So, and to this end, we need, of course, a function. And now we ha don't have function on RD. We have now function measures. We have functions in our um, Wasserstein spaces. And um, yeah, and then we go as before. We define now this velocity field here as some 
uh, as a velocity field, which is in this tangent space I had shown you, in this tangent space on, on this Wasserstein space. And we go um, into direct, and this velocity field has now to be in the subdifferential of f at the point where we are. Or with other words, if you think again as a gradient, this f of t is again whatever it should be here. It's somehow like the negative gradient of this function f, except that your function f now lives on a probability space. Also it's exactly as before. Yeah, but um, now with something more of definitions. Yeah, you need to reduce. Crochet subdifferential instead of subdifferential, but basically it's the same absolute continuity plus a direction where your curve has to be. Good. Okay. So there is one thing which we didn't like too much about these Wasserstein gradient flows, namely that this definition only holds almost everywhere for t larger zero. Also you cannot say that, that this equation must be fulfilled for all t, only almost everywhere. And we wanted to do something where we can define it for all t in zero to infinity. And we did so in a paper, which is uh, meanwhile, or we published in 2022, but it's a little bit longer on archive. It took a while in this normal reviewing process. What we defined were so-called Wasserstein deepest descent flows. And these Wasserstein deepest descent flows are really defined that you take the S before, you take the derivative of gamma of T, and then you take, yeah, this is not really a gradient, it's something like a steepest descent direction here of this F. So this will not be the main part of my talk. It will pop up sometimes in my talk. For this talk, I concentrate just on this definition, on this definition of, um, of a Wasserstein gradient flow. And this is nice to have, and uh, we found it very nice, but uh, it's not the main part of my talk. I really, really just want to mention it, that it also exists such a definition. Good, okay, now we have, we know how these curves look like. Let us now have it, some examples. Here is just a remark that this Wasserstein deepest descent direction may exist, even if this Fouché subdifferential in the first definition is empty. And um, a second remark is, I said we defined Wasserstein's deepest descent flow, what they have to do with these Wasserstein gradient flows. So how are these definitions are related to each other? And we have a theorem, as long as your function is lambda convex along generalized geodesic, I will not explain this, think about general uh, lambda convex along geodesics, then both definitions really are the same, yeah? But they, they start to be not the same if you have functions f which are not lambda convex along generalized geodesics or along geodesics. And this it comes in a minute, yeah? So far, we have just a definition of Wasserstein gradient. Now let us have a look at an example. The typical example of functions f looks as follows. It is a function f of mu of a measure, which usually consists of three parts, or some of these three parts, I have to say. The first part is a, such a potential part where you have um, a function f. And here I assume that this mu here is absolutely continuous. Either I'm really in a comfortable, uh, in a comfortable um, setting that this mu is absolutely continuous, and this is the density here. And then the first part of this function is f of this density. So what for what you can take, for example, here, you can take, for example, p log p. This f is p log p, then it's the entropy, for example. Yeah, The entropy is a, is a very special example here for such a function. So this guy is a repulsion term. You will see it in a minute. It's some p of x d mu. And then very often also appears such a red part where you have two times this measure mu here. And this blue and this red part will have to do with our motivating example at the beginning. You will see it later. So, okay, now you can try to do, and we put this functional to plus infinity if we are here, if this mu is uh, not absolutely continuous. So we are in a situation where we more or less only consider absolutely continuous. Um, you know, uh, as measures, absolutely continuous measures. So, and now as said later, we will see that, uh, or it, it happens that if the function is lambda convex along generalized geodesics, well, there will be many nice properties. And um, for, for functions of this kind, you can find in books, for example, of uh, Ambrosio, properties on this V, on this kernel key, and on this 
function f, when this functional here on the measures is lambda convex along generalized geodesics. There are properties, yeah, and you can characterize. So, and in this case, when we speak only about absolutely continuous measures, you can reformulate this continuity equation as a condition that your functional has to be, it was this, no, it was here, that your function fulfill this, fulfills this continuity equation. Yeah, You can reformulate this with respect to your, to your densities. Yeah, To your densities, your gamma of t is a measure, it's a curve which maps into a measure space. So gamma of t itself is a measure, and this measure has a density, and this density is here. And you can reformulate this equality uh, continuity equation then in this way. So this is now the continuity equation. This is my, my uh, vector field where the curve has to go. And it's related to the function f in this way. You have to take the functional derivative of f and then again the gradient. It looks a little bit fancy why you cannot just take the gradient here. It's the gradient descent, but it, it, it comes due to the Wasserstein geometry that really the vector field or the velocity field or the guy in your um, in your subdifferential looks like this with respect to f. So here's functional derivative and again the derivative. So now let's have a look at special examples of this example. So and uh, important functions here are the so-called kullback leitner function, which consists of the first and the second part. And you see, because we have this first part here, this kullback leitner function is related with absolutely continuous measures. And the second thing will be the MMD function. And in the MMD function, it does no longer appear this first part here. The density does no longer appear. And that's why this function also works for, non, um, for measures which are non-absolutely continuous. We will see it in a minute. So, okay, let's start with the following. We take now a function f of mu, which consists only of the first and of the second part. Yeah, and we take a very special function, namely the Kullback Leibniz diverging. So here we are. We take this function, and this is the Kullback Leibniz divergence. And here you have the first function, the black one. This is just an entropy. This is the Shannon entropy or negative Shannon entropy. P of x uh, is, is the density times P of a log p of x times p of x dx, black part. So the second part is this blue part, and this consists now of this is this v, and v is this log of q of x, and this q is comes from this measure nu here. This is the density function of this measure nu. So what we want to do, this was the intention at the beginning, we want to find a minimizer of this function by using, using a gradient descent. Yeah, approach, yeah, a gradient descent approach in the Wasserstein space. So you want to find a minimizer. Now you would tell me, okay, are you shitting me? If you have a kullback leibner divergence on probability measures, then I know what the minimizer is. Namely, the minimizer of this functional is, of course, nu, because kl is larger or equal than zero, and it's equal to zero if mu is equal to nu. So I know the minimizer. Why all these things with this gradient descent if I know the minimizer? The thing is the following. Even if you know a measure here, yeah, or you know the density of this measure, what people want to do, they want to sample from this measure. And this is not possible even if you know the density of the measure. And there's the whole industry who are doing Markov, uh, Shane, Monte Carlo methods, and, 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 to find a way to, to sample from such densities. And the Wasserstein gradient flow for this function would give you a possibility to sample from this measure here namely by moving with samples to this direction. So let me say, show what, what happens here. So first I can go, I can write down for this function now, the, the continuity equation, I go back again. You see this continuity equation looks like this. And it's very easy to write it down. If F is a Kubik leibner function, it's easy to compute this uh, functional derivative. And it's easy to take, and then you have to write the gradient here. This is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm writing down, I start with something, and this is just the equation which comes out from the continuity equation. If I go into the direction of, uh, as this into, and I take here the functional derivative of this f. This comes out. So, and this is a well-known Fokker-Planck equation. So, and if you now uh, assume that this Q here is comes from a Gibbs density, that Q has the form of a constant, 
because it should be a probability measure at the end, and a to the power of something, then you came out with this, this equation. And this is known as then this is a diffusion, of course, and this is a drift equation, and this is the usual form uh, how Fokker Planck equation appears. So, but nobody wants to solve this Fokker Planck equation. You can try this and do this, but this is not what people are usually doing. The good thing with this Fokker Planck equation is that this partial differential equation is related to a stochastic ordinary differential equation. And the stochastic ordinary equation is the overdamped Lagrangian equation. Huh? Um, okay, and this looks like this. You have now a random variable, which you start with the random variable x0, and then you compute such an ordinary stochastic differential equation with the Brownian motion here. Or what you are doing is, if you do this, um, yeah, this is the ODE, the stochastic ODE, this Langevin SDE, and uh, now you can use a Euler forward or a Euler Maria Maya forward step to compute this or, or compute solutions or approximate solutions of this Langevin stochastic differential equations. And this looks then like this. That means a uh, new sample from your previous distribution. You apply here then the gradient of phi at the sample point. You add a little bit Gaussian noise here and you get a new point. And if you do this, then this is a flow which goes from some sample, say from a Gaussian distribution where you can easily sample from, and you go along this part and you arrive finally if t goes to infinity at, at a function which, um, which is somehow related to a sample from this distribution from where the cubic Leibniz divergence has its minimum. So it's, I think it's somehow clear the way to sample from this distribution, you can use this ordinary differential equation, which is somehow a Wasserstein gradient flow, a discretization. So, okay. Now let's go to the uh, other case. Can I ask mm -hmm. just a quick question about the previous slide that you showed us? So uh, are you starting with a measure mu and nu that we assume have uh, a density? So uh, what are we trying to do with the Wasserstein gradient flow equation that you have here, the focal plank equation? So what are the- flow. Nothing. This is just to show you that you have oh. this focal plank equation and you have the following. Now, if you have a look at this, you must derive from this, this is not so easy, derive from this focal plank equation that is, is related, that is, this is ah, so, okay, sorry for that. Yeah, I understand your question. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I understand what you mean. Okay. Just this, this x is a random variable, no? and the random variable has a law. No? It has a distribution. And in this case, this this random variable has a distribution which is which is absolutely continuous. Yeah. The law of this is absolutely continuous. And this rho of t is the density of the law of this random variable. Do you understand? This is a random variable. Yes. This is it's much clearer. Probability <laughs> dx. And this is exactly the, the, the density of this random variable. And you can describe so, this flow either with the Fokker Planck equation or with this. Okay, but okay. just something to sample. That's it's great. Much Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, you can use this or you can use this. And here you just have the sampling process. Here you have to solve an ordinary differential, uh, the, the partial differential equation for the whole density. But you, you are not interested in the whole density. You're interested in sampling. Okay? Thank you. So, good. Now let's go to the second part, namely to the part I'm interested in. This just was just to show you what happens with Langevin dynamic and what Pierre is doing, Pierre Weiss is here, and he's doing these Langevin things, and we are also doing this. But uh, my talk is about the different thing, namely about this part here, the blue and the red one. So forget about this now and go to the blue and the red one, and let's have a look at another functional which gives us the blue and the red one. By the way, if you go here, there are many stochastic differential equations, which gives the same the same Fokker Planck equation. This is one of them, but this is another story. So, okay. Now let's find a functional which consists of the blue and the other part. And this is now the max one of these functional is the maximum mean distribution. And in order to describe this, I need a function k. You have seen in the red part, there was this k. And this must be a kernel, which is conditionally positive definite, which means that whenever you take some points x and g and rd, n of them, and it's also arbitrary, you multiply it with a, g and, um, I, a, I and a, g, then this must be small or equal than zero, as long as the sum of these guys here is equal to zero. This equal to zero, this condition comes from this word conditionally positive definite. So if you then you can define a so-called interaction energy, energy, 
This is just, you take this kernel here and you take d mu. And in a minute it comes, but mu has to do again with a mu and a mu. So this is an eta here. So this is a signed measure and you can find such an interaction. So and now comes the definition of the maximum mean discrepancy of mu and mu. Like similar, think about Kubek Leibner. It's not Kubek Leibner, but it's also a discrepancy between measures. So and it's defined as follows. You take now this interaction energy of this signed measure, mu minus nu. And if you compute this and plug this mu minus nu here in, then you came up with an expression like this. So, and now I make again out of this ex expression as function, and I want to follow a gradient flow of this function in order to sample from this mu. Same story as before, yeah? Uh, so, okay, and the first thing, if I look at this, I say again, nu is known. For example, if you think about my motivating example, this nu was a digital image. It was this atomic measure. I know what's happened here. I know this nu. So, so, and then I have a look at this, and this is a constant. If I want to minimize with respect to mu, then this is a constant. So I forget this. This is not interesting if I minimize something. And I came up with this guy and this guy. So and now I uh, I see what or I, I can show you the relation to my motivation, namely if I plug in now such a kernel here k is equal to minus x minus y to the power of r, not y cuts r, not r equal to minus one, but r between zero and two, then this is called a Ries kernel, and I plug in my measure. This was my image measure. This was mu. And I plug in my mu, this is now the points where I want to go. Mu is not known, this is something I want to find. Then if I plug it in, I came exactly out with the functional I've shown you at the beginning. This is the attraction term, and this is the repulsion term. And what I want to do now, I want to start with some initial guesses of these point positions. I want to think, I want to follow a flow. Hopefully my gradient flow is, is the Wasserstein gradient flow. We will speak about this in one minute. And then I will, will go somehow to this correct points, which minimize somehow this guy. First remark, this is indeed a discrepancy of statistical measures, meaning that uh, Kubek Leibniz is not symmetric. This is also symmetric here. But um, the, the important thing is that this is larger or equal than zero for mu, for mu and nu, and it's equal to zero exactly as, exactly as mu is equal to nu. And I have to choose my kernel appropriately that this is really a, a, a stochastic divergence. For example, for this Ries kernel, it is a stochastic divergence. And really, it holds through that um, this is zero if and only if mu is equal to nu, as long as I'm in the correct probability space. Yeah, I have to be in P sub R, but this is related to this R, but this is not important. So, okay, now let's see, let's speak about the Wasserstein gradient flows of this. I have shown you, if you take this, um, this Kubek Leibner, the nice Fokker Planck equation came out. But this can be also written down if you don't have densities. No, this is, this is possible here. This has no, here no density appears in this function. I haven't written if mu is any, not if mu has not a density, I set this function to plus infinity. I don't do this here. I just write this down. Okay, now let's have a look and again, but we need in order to, to, to characterize our gradient flows is this, uh, this uh, continuity equation. And in the continuity equation for the vector field, I need the functional derivative of this guy. And then if it exists, the gradient. So the functional derivative of this MMD functional is easy to compute. It's just this, it's very easy. So, and now, comes the next step in order to get the vector field, I have to take the gradient of this guy. So the gradient may not exist. In particular, if my kernel here is this Ries kernel, you cannot differentiate a Ries kernel in absolute value at zero. So let us first have a look at smoother kernels. Yeah, as before, and that is what I've written here, this Wasser, if this is a Wasserstein gradient flow and the Wasserstein gradient flow itself depends on the kernel. So, and let's start with smooth curve, say two times continuous the differential curves. So then you can write this gradient down. This is your vector field and this continuity equation. And of course, then you can plug this gradient here into the, into the, into the integral and you came up with this. So, and if you now assume that uh, you have, again, you start with an absolutely continuous measure and you have such a nice vector field in your continuity equation, yeah, where is the continuity equation here? If you have now this nice vector field here from my MMD flow, 
And then you came out with a differential equation like this. This is no longer Fokker plan. It, <laughs> it has no divergence here, as a no diffusion. So it, this doesn't lead to a stochastic differential equation. This is not, not the case. Nevertheless, you can try to compute this if you want and if you are interested in this density here. So, okay, the first thing is you can show if you if you go now along this here that you you should ask, okay, I start in absolutely continuous measure. If I do Wasserstein gradient flow, do I stay along this curve in an absolutely continuous measure? Is every point of this curve indeed in absolutely continuous measure? And you can show the answer is really yes. Every point on the curve, if you start with absolutely continuous measure, it remains absolutely continuous measures. And you can write it like this, this is for sure. Now you can ask me, okay, what happened is if I start, this is not the thing you did with your images. In your images, you started with some points and you wanted the points move to the correct direction. That means you start with an empirical measure or with an atomic measure. What happens if you have a smooth curve and you start in a, with an atomic measure? And then you can show, you can do exactly the same thing. And then you came up with an ordinary differential equation for these points here in, in T. And this ordinary differential equation is exactly a gradient descent direct and the equation. So the message, if the kernel is smooth in your MMD, then atomic measures stay atomic measures. And then instead of having a PDE like here, you have just an ODE for these points here, which move in time. So everything is nice and you have just an ordinary movement of points, an ordinary, um, uh, not an ordinary differential equation as, lo as long as the kernel is smooth, okay? And then it's just, this is my answer to, to, my, to my think here. You see, is, is, is this what I did with my ordinary flow of points? Is this a Wasserstein gradient flow? And the answer is, if this kernel is smooth, but it isn't, you see, if this kernel is smooth, yes, it's a Wasserstein gradient flow. Unfortunately, my kernel is not smooth, namely in the case r equal to one, which is my favorite case. This is the distance here, the two norm. This is not smooth and zero. So let me go back. Um, okay, so yeah, maybe it's too much here. So, okay, I'm, I'm at this position now. So what happens if the kernel is not smooth? That's interesting. So, and namely, if I take my favorite kernel, a Ries kernel here, in particular, R equal to one. Then, um, yeah, I have to, this is a matrix again in the correct space. The best thing with this kernel is that then my functional, my MMD functional with this attraction and this repulsion term, this fixed nu, is no longer lambda convex along geodesics. And you cannot use standard theory for this. So, and then you can, can, can see things may happen. Namely, for example, if you take only this repulsion, repulsion term, which, which puts the particles away from each other, and you start in a delta measure, delta theory, if this would be a, if this would be a smooth kernel, you would remain with deltas. It would remain uh, an empirical measure, and this point would move then somewhere. So, if you take now this kernel, this Ries kernel, say with r equal to one, then the following happens in two D. You start with a single point here, and after the start, this measure becomes immediately an absolutely continuous measure, which is supported on a ball. And this ball, if the time goes ahead, becomes fast larger and larger. This is just sampling from the ball. Yeah, these are just samples from the ball. So, and uh, this this uh, absolutely continuous measure has a density on this ball, and the density is tighter at the boundary of this ball. You see it a little bit here are more points if, you, if I sample from this. So, and in 2D, it's again different. You start with the delta and with this kernel, Wasserstein gradient flows doesn't remain a delta. It becomes immediately a measure. And in 3D, this measure is not absolutely continuous now. It has a singular support and it's supported on the boundary of the sphere. Yeah, on this boundary, so it's con condensated the boundary of, uh, at, the, at the surface of, of the sphere, or it's on the sphere and surface of the ball. So and the interesting relation between these two guys is, if you consider a measure which is uniformly distributed now in the 3D case on the sphere, you take the tangential plane and then you project this measure on the tangential plane. 
then you can imagine that there are more points at the boundary than in the middle. And this is exactly now the density in 2D which you obtain. Yeah. And now you can ask how to describe such um, such measures, how to uh, how to get these results, how we got these results. This is um, one result we got with our considerations of these kernels here, how we get this. So, and the, the answer is what you have to do is you have to consider a backward scheme um, in order to uh, find these, or in order to find this, um, solve this differential equation, this ordinary differential equations. You know, if you solve ordinary differential equations, you can take Euler forward or Euler backward. And this is something like an Euler backward scheme. Namely, you take uh, the so-called proximum of this function, you take f of mu, and then you add here the Wasserstein 2 distance. And then you take the minimizer over this mu here. It's not the same mu as before, it's just here the minimizer, the argument which I take here. So and one can show that somebody may know from convex analysis the proximum of functions in RD. So and this is exactly the same. You know this proximal guy has the same minimizer as this f, and you add here something in order to make it a little bit smoother. So and you can do the same in Wasserstein spaces, just replacing the Euclidean norm by this Wasserstein norm. So and then you can show as long as your function magic word is lambda convex along generalized geodesics and your lambda, it, this must not be positive. It can be negative, but the step size or the tau must not be positive. But uh, this, this lambda must be larger than minus one divided by tau. And if this function has this property, then this proximum exists and it is uh, unique. So, and then you can start such a backward scheme by starting with some measure here. You start with some measure um, measure mu here, this mu zero, and you compute the max, the proximum of mu zero. Yeah, you start with mu zero, you compute the proximum, you get mu one. Then you plug in mu one, you get mu two. This is the proximal algorithm, no? So, and then from these mu's which you obtain here, you build a curve and the curve, the curve, the values of this curve are measures. And the curve is the following. First, you take between, this is a discretization between tau and um, between zero and tau on your curve. Yeah, this is the time on your curve. You take the measure mu zero where you're starting with. Then in the second time step from tau to two tau, you take the first proximum limit. It's again a, a constant function. And then you do this along your way. And then you let tau go to zero. Also you get then a, a, a curve here. You get a whole curve here then, which consists of, which is a, a piecewise constant. Yeah, it consists of these measures. And then you let tau go to zero. And then you can show as long as your functional f is, again, magic word, lambda convex along generalized geodesics, then you can show that this, this constant, partially constant curve, the constants become smaller and smaller, goes to the curve, which gives you the Wasserstein gradient. So, and this was shown by Yard and Kinderlehrer Otto many years ago. So, and then you have this, um, you can compute this Wasserstein gradient flow on this way. And this is exactly how we showed these things uh, with this delta and what delta is doing. And we can also do this for more than one point by, by just computing the proximum here, starting with delta zero, and then have a look what happens over the, the time with this proximum. Also, in order to prove these results I have shown you, we need this backward propagation. So, and interestingly, the computation of this proximum here has to do with equilibrium measure problems, namely, this is here, I write down the proximum in the Wasserstein space with this functional. This is the Wasserstein distance between delta zero and eta, and this then becomes such an expression, and such expressions are well known in the society, and in, yeah, and they're interesting for some people who are dealing with these problems in potential theory. So, okay. So to take away, if we take risk kernels, more interesting things can happen. So, and what we are doing now is the following. We want to learn these, these, uh, these um, backward schemes, these jordan kinder otto schemes. And um, yeah, okay, here is again the scheme. No? You plug in the previous measure, you get a new measure by computing this proximum. So, and now we rewrite this a little bit. So, and the first rewriting is related to the Bernier theorem, namely, we know, we know if this functions here on the way, if 
these functions are absolutely continuous, then you can write them down as in, in such a way here, it's such a push forward. And you can write down this, this step here, this proximal step in such a way that you have no longer to compute measures here, but you compute now are maps, yeah? And this is just, uh, if you push forward this, you get the next measure. And this is just the Wasserstein distance here. So we can write it down now in such a way. And then you can try, can use, we can use this as a loss function in order to learn this, this, this mapping T now. And we say, okay, we plug, we say now this mapping T should be a neural network and we can try to learn this or we learn this by minimizing such a function. And so we learn the steps from in this in this Jordan Kinderlehrer Otto scheme, from one measure to the next measure. Yeah. And this was not done by us, this was done by other people here. They learn these transport maps in, in your Wasserstein distance or Wasserstein gradient flows. And here are some names who did it. You can also try to learn not this T directly, this map from uh, L2 RD to RD to RD with respect to you can also try to learn this potential. This is another story and just uh, this leads to input convex neural networks. Yeah, you can try to learn this also. So, but what we did, this is only for absolutely continuous measures. So, and what we did, we want to do this for measures which are not absolutely continuous. We want to start with points. So, and then we can do similar things, but we have to replace this transport map now by a transport plan because this, this map doesn't exist or you cannot work with this in, in general. So, and then something comes out with, which looks like this. And yeah, now you can say, okay, now do the similar things and learn this, learn this plan, but you cannot learn plans. Of course, you only can learn maps because networks are maps. So, and, but what you can do is to learn the disintegration of these plans here. And this is exactly what we did. We write down, wrote down the so-called disintegration of these plans. I have not enough time, unfortunately, to explain this. And then we can try to learn these maps or these, these, these integrations of the plans again with a neural network. And so we did. And I so show some numerical results. Here is again this example where I don't use this MMD, this maximum mean discrepancies, but just the, uh, the repulsion functional. Yeah? And this is exactly what our flow is doing. If we learn now a network which goes from one step to the other step, it looks very similar to the previous one. And we start really in one point with this flow, yeah, really in one point. And here's just the comparison. If you start not in one point, but you take just a particle flow from here to here, which is particle with this learned network. Yeah, the network goes from, um, also this is the same as this, but with many particles in a very small area, I can make it a little bit smaller, larger. Also, so this is a completely different scale. And this is, is not one point here, these are many points in contrast to the picture here, where this is really one point and not many particles, yeah? So, and then it depends a little bit how these particles are populated. If you go, if you take a flow with them, with these learned networks, then uh, you see that finally the shape of this initial shape survives a little bit. Yeah, you see it survives a little bit over a long time. Okay, finally it goes to a distribution you want, but it survives. So, and let us see, how of the distributions now not just with this repulsion term but also with the attraction term this is now my target 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 measure mm -hmm. i want these are the points where i want to go and now i learn a network which goes from these two points into the direction of this distribution it will not match these points exactly because i don't do really a gradient flow i learn the steps of these gradient flows uh, in the Jordan Kinderlehrer Otto scheme. Also, this is done by a network now. So, and this is how it just works. And this is the homage on Max and Moritz. Max and Moritz are two guys um, where in, which were invented by Wilhelm Busch. And Wilhelm Busch was the famous, famous author who lived in Berlin. That's why we took it. So, and but you see again, uh, uh, and here's an, another example where the gradient flow is dysfunctional. And here, the interesting thing is that the gradient flow starts with an absolutely continuous measure. And then if I would have an MMD, this is now an MMD flow, also the, I have an attraction term, but uh, if I would start with, um, with uh, if I would have a continuous kernel, then this would stay an absolutely continuous measure. But now, 
because I have a risk kernel, which is not differentiable, it can happen that this absolute on the path to the desired measure, that it can become, that doesn't stay absolutely continuous, but it becomes uh, a singular measure. And here the singular measure lives on a line. It splits here and then it splits up down here. So you can do many interesting things by using Wasserstein gradient flows with non-smooth curves. So, but I was not fast enough <laughs> to show you all the things I want to show, and I have already one hour. So I, I think I should skip my last example or my last thing, which is also very nice. Namely, now I want to show you how to compute these things in a fast way via the idea of slicing, namely by putting this on something which is done in the radon transform, namely by putting the measure on, uh, by projecting the measure on lines. And then many nice things can happen, in particular, if you take a risk kernel. And if somebody wants to hear it, I can I can explain it because I have prepared it, but I explained too much. I just want to show some final images here because an hour is over. Um, uh, this is something we can do now. We can start with some uh, some some particles here in the point. We can go with these particles to a distributions on curves here. If we do it with the risk kernel, it, it works better. But I, it makes not too much sense. I just want to show what we do. We we do something no longer just with point into these. In, like in my initial example, we can do now something in high dimensions, for example, in dimension 784 with MNIST or with CIFAR, we can use our networks uh, to generate some images here. And we can also do it with conditional things, namely here, uh, that we can generate um, something where we say, okay, we want to generate only trousers or we want to generate only shoes. But this is another example. It's, 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 it's another story. It's related to the fourth part of my talk, which I, was unfortunately not fast enough to show this slide part here. This, maybe you have to invite me again to show this. Um, okay, we can do this with inverse problems, with uncertainty quantifications, and so on. It's just something we did. So, okay, so after one hour, I was too slow, and I realized uh, what I did was just to show you results on NMD Wasserstein gradients flows. I have shown you that. Um, for functions which are non-smooth and not, if the kernels are non-smooth such that the functions are not lambda convex, interesting things may happen. Uh, we can escape the absolutely continuous set setting. We can make interesting things. And I have shown you that we can use neural networks in order to learn these Wasserstein gradient flows, in order to learn the back uh, the backward scheme and also this forward scheme we invented at the beginning, we can also learn this by neural networks and then we can generate something. And what I have unfortunately not shown is how we can accelerate it via slicing and what rule the risk kernel is playing here. It's again a very nice kernel and how we can use this acceleration in order to generate um, images in order to generate uh, other things, and order also in order to solve inverse problems via posterior sampling. I put the slides, I think the slides will be uh, also on, on in the web, and if you are interested in this, um, you can have a look at the slides, and I, if you wish, I can also explain it to you. I would be happy to do this, of course, but I was too slow. So, okay. Here is some literature about this. This is about things I have just explained to you with the three kernel. This was the neural step. This is also about the first part I have explained to you with three kernels. Interesting things in Wasserstein gradient flows and steepest descent flows and backwards flows may happen. Yeah, and these are already the papers on the fourth part of my talk, how I generate something or how I sample from the posterior. So, yeah, okay, this was the last talk in this seminar I have heard from Axel. So it remains to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And this is the Kudam in Berlin at this time. And I have to say that's the contribution of Berlin to climate protection. So, okay, thank you very much for your attention. So, thank I'm you. very sorry that I cannot finish the fourth part, which is it. Again, of course, extremely interesting, and I want to explain this, but maybe next time. 
Yes, maybe next time. So thank you for the very, very nice talk. Uh, are there questions? We can take a few of them at least. Uh, maybe I can start. If it, if, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Gabriela, for taking the time to go slowly through everything and uh, explain these things to us. I have a question. Maybe the answer is uh, go and read the paper. But uh, do you have an intuitive, uh, like say, proof or explanation on why the Wasserstein gradient flow, if you have a smooth kernel, it stays like, and you start with absolutely continuous measures, it stays absolutely continuous, and and, and what goes wrong when you take a non-smooth kernel? Like the example that you showed us, how do you actually technically prove that if you start from a Dirac, then it starts pr propagating into a, a, den uh, a density um, supported on a sphere or on a ball, as you said? Uh, is there any positive explanation on why this happens? How can you show it? Uh, I have really to compute this, um, what I call it gradient. This, this, um, it was in my talk at the very beginning where this was the gradient with the minus. And I have really to compute this. It's really because of the non-differentiability at this point, and I have to go into a steepest descent direction on the curve. And the steepest descent direction, you can co really compute this. I, I, what I have shown you was just an example for delta zero, no? if I start in delta zero. We have it now also for more points. This is very simple, and you have really to compute it. If you go to our paper, you see it. We really compute this, and then you see that uh, it becomes immediately an absolutely continuous measure. But you have really to compute this. It took us a while. So, okay, so, so it's it's a, the non differentiability yeah. here that you don't yeah. you need a gradient decent direction, but in Wasserstein space, it's a little bit harder to see what it is. You have to compute okay. this even okay, in, in one even in one day. If you want to have a look at this and to understand it, we have a paper where everything is done in one D. In one D, you can embed the Wasserstein distance in um, in an isometrically way in in a cone in 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 in. in, in, mm -hmm. in in space, it's much easier then. And then you can see immediately that even in 1D, you start with delta in zero, you want to go to a delta in, in one also. And then immediately, if you start with this, you can really compute this, take this differential equation, take the definition, and then you can really compute this direction and you see immediately it becomes absolutely continuous. And this doesn't happen for, uh, for smooth kernels because then you can compute this derivative of K and then you can write everything down. This, uh, mm -hmm. I wrote the names down. If you want to see something for smooth curves, you can go into this paper of Abel. Okay, thank Abel. you. And then, then you see this. But mm -hmm. we really computed it. But oh, I, okay, uh, thank you. If you have something to write, I can show you. Okay, great, thank you. So if, I can also send it to you. If you yeah. can email, then I can mark it for you and then I can send it. Right. Great, thanks, Gabriel. Yeah, so this was actually also my question. Uh, so are there any more from the audience? I, I have the time for a tiny question, but I have to leave for another meeting in three minutes. So it will be, uh, please answer uh, shortly. I'm not being so slow up here, but I, I like to explain things and just going through the slides. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. It was, it was very nice. Uh, my question was, uh, you you mentioned this link between the, this gradient descent and the Wasserstein gradient flow. I was wondering how it relates to the the work of uh, Shiza, Linda Shiza. Um, yeah, yeah, um, it's it's related, and and we also have it on the screen. But yes, now we we have to speak what uh, as he takes particle flows. You must be, you must distinguish between different things. Okay, you have three minutes. Okay. What I consider was really this MMD. And I don't say that MMD on measures, yeah? You can do a second step and say you consider this functional F mu and you say F mu is, is you set F mu equal to plus infinity if mu is not longer an empirical measure, okay? Also these are yeah. two different functional. One functional is a functional which works on all measures. And the other functional is that you set it to plus infinity if you leave empirical measure. And then for the second functional, this is also a Wasserstein gradient flow. And I think this is something which uh, goes to Shizat's direction because he, he does something with particles. And then I don't know, I think he takes mean field limits, no? If the particles uh, yes. come more and more. This is the second step. Yeah, yeah, we have to go. Yeah. It's related, definitely, but uh, yeah. 
I see. Well, so thank you very much. Be very careful what you are doing, no, and uh, what you are speaking about. about yeah, that. it's up to all. I'm, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. But, but, uh, by the way, uh, Pierre, Cesar smoothed it out. No, he smoothes um, MMD or he smoothes the functional out by by adding something which, which. Uh, I think he added W two such that he becomes also some kind like a proxy there. But maybe we can discuss it if you want. Yeah, I'm yeah, 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 I'm still here. Uh, you should yeah, okay. It. You should come to, to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I think organize a conference. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. In two years, we'll organize one, but not this year. Okay. In <laughs> Goodbye. Two years, in, in two years, there will also be the in Paris again. Mm. Not yeah, next year, okay. but in 26. But uh, then it's it's too late because then everything is done. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Good, goodbye. <laughs> Um, um, yes, more questions from the audience. Uh, I'm really sorry. I, I saw Amin. I mean, Iska, you have a question, but we see each other next week. Maybe we can discuss it then. I mean, are you still there? Sure. Ah, great. <laughs> Shall I ask <laughs> I a question? Do you know? Do you know? I see you next week. Yeah, I see you next week. Do you then want you me can to ask a question? You can discuss it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, but you can uh, ask a question. I can. I, I will uh, ask you on Reese kernels. Is that okay? Yeah. So for yeah, the of course, of course. Okay. for the, I have for the... many questions to you oh. because you're an expert in kernels. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Good to see you. See you next uh, week in in Hamburg. Um, take care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all I can add. And Merry Christmas to all. Yes. It's nice to be part of this uh, of this uh, lecture. Thanks uh, for making this. Great. Okay, so we ask next week. <laughs> okay, but I have three questions for you about okay. the kernel mean embedding in, in recursive kernel Hilbert spaces. We need okay. to. Okay, very good. Okay. In that spirit, uh, I think we should uh, round off this lecture and this seminar for this semester. We will be back next semester with more talks.